Hello, I'm Rachel Gilkey, Director of Programming and Education at Irish Arts Center, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's conversation, A Brief History of Art and Radio Astron Astronomy with visual artist George Bolster. George just opened his show at Ulterior Gallery in the Lower East Side in New York City this past Saturday. And today he'll be in conversation with Denise Marconish, Senior Curator and Director of Exhibitions at Mass MoCA. And the conversation is moderated by Miranda Driscoll. Miranda is the Interim Executive Director at Solus Nua, who are also our partners on today's talk. I'm very pleased to introduce Miranda. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so thank you so much to yourself and Irish Arts Centre for hosting, um, along with Solus Nua, which is a multidisciplinary organization based in Washington, DC, that presents Irish art, contemporary art. Um, along with Ulterior Gallery, which is a commercial gallery in the Lower East Side um, that presents international and emerging art to um, New York audiences. So um, a partnership, I guess, with three very different perspectives and um, possibly three audiences that we can't see, but we know and hope are there somewhere. Um, and today, I guess we have one thing in common, and that's George Bolster. No pressure, George, there. Um, so just a very brief introduction, really, to our two speakers. George Bolster is a, a multidisciplinary art, Irish artist based in New York City. Um, and he's exhibited in his exhibited work in museums and galleries in Europe, America, Canada, Korea, and elsewhere. And as um, Rachel mentioned, his solo show has just opened in Ulterior Gallery um, and runs until December 20th. So it's open to the public um, safely. So I think they're doing um, limited numbers in the galleries, but you can also see the work on their, ex on their um, website. Um, so George approaches his work through, I suppose, a lens of um, science, art history, science fiction, um, to examine what he sees as, as some of our most pressing concerns, species-wide wide challenges, um, you know, which of course includes um, the destruction of the environment in which humans and anim other animals can survive, um, and also the, the, what he calls the future legacy of human cultural production, uh, particularly, particularly artwork. So we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, Denise Marconish is the Senior Curator and Head of Exhibitions at Mass MoCA, which is in North Adams, Massachusetts, um, which I'm very happy to claim as my, my local museum, which is just an hour down the road from where I sit in Vermont currently. Um, recently, Denise has worked with artists such as Trenton Doyle Hancock, Teresita Fernandez and Nari Ward, and she's edited books such as Teresita Fernandez' Wayfinding and Wonder, uh, sorry, Wayfinding and Wonder, 50 Years of RISD Glass, and she co-edited um, Sol Lewitt, 100 Views, which was published by Yale University Press. Okay, so what we're going to do this afternoon is... Um, George is going to show us a couple of clips of his work, and I know he has some images uh, he wants to show us, and then we're going to kind of use that as an, as an anchor for discussion. Um, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section, and we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that Max Smith at this point as well at the Irish Arts Centre, who's providing our technical assistance. Uh, we can't see you, Max, but it's very reassuring to know you're there. Um, so before we just go to our first clip and set of images. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of introduce the audience to your working relationship and how your paths sort of crossed. Um, and perhaps I could ask you, Denise, just to start with talking about your involvement with SETI. Um, so SETI, for those of you who don't know, is the Search for Extra Extraterrestrial Intelligence um, Institute, and it hosts a, um, a residency program uh, that George undertook a number of years, over a number of years. So, and I think it really underpins um, much of his thinking ever since. So maybe you could chat a little bit about that, Denise, to get us started. Almost forgot to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> thanks, Miranda. And, um, you know, I think George and I first met, I always forget, I think it was about 15 years ago. Um, and um, I was lucky enough to show his work here 
at Mass Mocha uh, back in 2009. Um, and, um, you know, we've always just um, liked a lot of the same things and I've always, you know, supported his work and um, over the years. And so um, I can't, I'm trying to remember what year this all started. I think it was probably around 2013 or 14 when um, a, an artist who um, I knew, Charlie Lindsay, was, had met Jill Tarter. Jill Tarter is one of the founders of SETI. People probably most famously know her as the real life person that Carl Sagan wrote about um, in the book Contact, which was then turned into a movie with Jodie Foster. Um, that character Jodie Foster plays is based on Jill, a really, you know, one of the few women in this field of, um, of SETI and of astrophysics and, um, and, you know, somebody who I had always looked up to and admired for um, her work in that realm. And, and Charlie had met Jill and, and suggested that SETI have an artist in residence program. Of course, many, many years ago, NASA had a very, very, briefly lived artisan residence program with Laurie Anderson as their um, first and only artisan residence. <laughs> um, and so we thought this could be a, a great opportunity to um, bring artists into this environment. And I think, and, and George can certainly speak to this too, I think what we immediately realized is that it's not about illustrating science. It's not about um, making art just about their research, but it's about what happens when you bring artists together with scientists and just let them have open conversations. Um, you realize how much of both of their work is based on leaps of faith and sort of believing doggedly in what they're doing, even when other people might say, I'm not so sure. And so, you know, SETI one point was a part of NASA and now it's its own uh, not-for-profit and you know they do amazing research there. So once Charlie was doing his residency there, then he brought me in to sort of help solidify what a long-term artist in residence program could look look like. And uh, George was in the first uh, full-on cohort uh, that we brought um, to Mountain View, California, where where they're based. And and he and I had have had the great pleasure of doing a couple trips to Mountain View, but also to Hat Creek, um, which is where their radio telescopes are. And, and NASA Ames as well. And to, yeah, the NASA Ames Research <laughs> Center, which is bonkers. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting, I think it's a great place to start because I, well, first of all, it's such a wonderful crossover, um, you know, in terms of research and just general curiosity about the world. And I think once, you know, this, this is something that we can talk about later, but just this, sometimes there can be this kind of um, maybe slippage of understanding and roles in a, in a situation like that. Um, and I think once, you know, that's the job of the kind of the middle person in a way to kind of navigate that, you know. And I know that SETI has a director of uh, programming who, who probably does a lot of that navigating because, like you say, I think sometimes in these residencies, they look amazing on paper and they um, can generate, um, you know, funding um and, and this seems extraordinarily successful um but i think there can be sometimes that that slight misunderstanding of of the fact that both parties are are they just have a curiosity and they're interested in research and that the artist isn't always expected to produce something and to make something but actually the the research is part of the work so um george do you want to do you want to start with showing us, you want to yeah. go into the next? let's start the presentation. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to tell a brief anecdote, which was, you know, when I arrived at, at SETI, um, sorry, when I first arrived at the first day at NASA Ames, actually, mm -hmm. um, there was a bone, a bone density specialist scientist, and she, do you, I don't know if you remember her name, Denise, but anyway, um, she was saying, I don't know if, how it works with art, but with science, you do an experiment, it fails, you do another experiment, it fails, you do another experiment, it fails, you do another experiment, you learn something, you expand some kind of possibility with that, and then eventually you find that research that you're looking for. And, you know, for me, in utter terror, that was an amazing moment 
uh, to see that, yes, it is exactly the same practice. It's just a different discipline. And so, um, so I'm just going to quickly run through these because it gives some context to everybody who isn't an astronomer about what uh, SETI actually does. So it is essentially the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It aims to detect evidence of technological civilizations that may exist elsewhere in the universe, particularly in our galaxy. There are potentially billions of locations outside of our solar system that may host life. Um, with their current technology, they have some ability to discover evidence of cosmic habitation, and in the specific case of their SETI experiments, to find um, that uh, to find beings that are at a technological level, at least as advanced as our own. And there are a number of things about time that we'll discuss later. Let's go to the next slide. So it began essentially as a proposition by Frank Drake, Francis Drake, um, in 1961. Uh, he developed an equation to estimate the number of advanced civilizations likely to exist in the Milky Way galaxy. This is before the discovery of a lot of exoplanets that have happened since. It's been proven uh, to be a durable framework for research and space technology has advanced scientists' knowledge of several variables. I'm not going to go through the Drake equation. The Drake equation is fantastically complex and it's online. Um, the discovery of extremophiles. Scientists invented the term extremophile to refer to the amazing microorganisms with ancient DNA that were discovered in the 1970s living in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. They thrive in conditions so extreme that no one would expect to find life flourishing there, which led to speculation about the moon Europa, which orbits Jupiter. They think there might be life living under miles of ice on that, on that moon. And also, you, there are other examples of this, such as uh, microorganisms that are in the cooling um, uh, Oh God, I can't even think of the term of that, but in nuclear reactors, they have cooling cooling, anyway, tower, that's tower, um, cooling towers. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but there are microorganisms that live and flourish in that. So it's astonishing. Um, this also led to SETI, you know, find the, the possibility of finding life in, in extreme environments being highly likely. And then exoplanet discovery. Based on data from the Kepler Space Telescope, it's estimated that there could be as many as 300 million potentially habitable planets in our galaxy. Now, when I began the residency, my jaw was on the floor, but it went through the floor within about two to three days. And so let's go to the next slide. So this is actually a compression of part of the cosmos, uh, the, um, the cosmic calendar that was written by um, Carl Sagan for the TV series. So the cosmic calendar compresses time into a year structure. Within it, the Big Bang, which occurred 15 billion years ago, occurs on January 1st. In May, the Milky Way formed, which we're part of, and other planetary systems appeared in June and July. But our solar systems uh, formed in mid-September. Each month in this calendar is 1.5 billion years long, and each day is 40 million years. Each second is 500 years of our history. It's an epic journey of an explosion from which there are still echoes. The ensuing condensation of matter, gas, dust, stars, galaxies meant for us planets the conditions for supporting life and intelligence. Humans have emerged so recently that our recorded history occupies the last seconds of the last minute of the final day of this, ca uh, this calendar year. The first humans evolve at 10.30 p.m. and begin their journey towards developing a sense of who and where they are. In the last 15 minutes, they tamed fire. At 11.59.20, the domestication of farm animals and settled agriculture begins alongside the human talent for making tools, shared by many other animals. We'll talk more about that later. Um, settlements evolved into cities and proximity prodded the need for the evolution of systems and communications. Um, in, everything in our history books occurs in the last 10 seconds. So let's start 
let's go to Margaret Race. Sorry, Cliff. That timeline never like fails to baffle me. It's just, it's, you, uh, you realize just how tiny and how small <laughs> we are in relationship to everything. And completely incidental. Yeah. And yet we're not. We take what we did during the uh, moon missions and the first step of workshops to think about human missions was to say, what did we do then? Did it work? Yes. We've got samples back here on Earth. And would we do it the same way? The answer is no, because lots of things have changed. Agencies have changed. Laws have changed. Our knowledge of the science has changed. And so has the public. The public wouldn't stand for you to say, trust us, it's OK. They want to know what you're doing. And environmental impact statements would require that any government launching, at least a US government launching missions up to Mars and bringing things back, would have to file an impact statement and tell the public what the concerns are, what the risks are, and how they're being addressed. The science also bumps into societal issues. They say, what is the risk of bringing back these samples? But it's not just that. Could that impact um, commerce? Could it have pandemics or um, plagues that would come back? And beyond that, you'd say, OK, I want to study this material I'm, I'm bringing back from Mars. And maybe I find a microbe in it. The first question, is that a microbe we brought with us from Earth? Is it a false positive? Or is it something that's really Martian? If it's really Martian, and we can show that the DNA is different than what we have here on Earth, or somehow it's biochemically unrecognizable as something from Earth, the next question is, what does that mean? Scientifically, people at SETI Institute and with NASA can help you address that question. But meaning goes beyond that. And the meaning of a second genesis is not something that a scientist can tell you about. Because if we find life up there, how does that relate to religion or ethics? And so there are all sorts of people who have asked that question. Um, this is different than asking questions of creation, but there are theologians that get involved in all of these questions as well. Because Judeo-Christians say, no problem. God made the heaven and earth, and it is good. But I don't know what a Buddhist would say. I don't know what someone who's a Hindu or some other religion would say or an atheist would say. So it needs other people to come in and be involved as well. So when we're first talking about it, we're talking about safety and making sure that we're doing things legally and by accepted policies. But beyond that, if we would find life out there, it is so much bigger. And we need all sorts of folks artists, theologians, eth ethicists, philosophers, and uh, lo a lot more as well. George, I think that's such a, it's such a great place to start um, because I think one of the things that you really brought to your time at SETI and, you know, again, to just backtrack, um, the SETI residencies are two years and you're, it's basically just up to you to connect with scientists who you find interesting. And I like that what you did was you brought a number of scientists to sit down with you and talk about their research, but not talk about it from that very traditional standpoint of science, but that you were really interested in getting them to philosophically think about what it means to be a scientist who's doing this research and therefore what it means to be a human in this world thinking about these things. So can you first tell us a little bit about Margaret Race and can you also talk a little bit about like how you sussed out the scientists who you were most interested in? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> firstly, it was just impossible. I mean, it really was an impossible task because you know, there's Natalie Cabral who is diving into the tops of volcanoes to test to see if there are microbes living there that couldn't possibly exist anywhere else. Um, you know, there's Lawrence Doyle who's working on information theory to interpret animal languages. There's Jill Tarter who was the director of SETI before she is now direct, uh, Emer Chair Emeritus, I think is her title. I'm sorry, Jill, if you're there and I got it wrong. Um, and there, 
there are people who deal with asteroids. I mean, it's so diverse that it, it became really because I'm based in New York that I would try to see who was available each time I met with somebody and it became a different kind of array of people each time because of that reason because people are traveling you know to the polar caps or or doing testing all sorts of things I mean so um it wasn't it was very kind of random how I came across people in the end um, and how I managed to work from that. So Margaret Race is the planetary protector at NASA. So she deals with all of the legislation governing any sample that is now brought back from any um, other planets, basically. When the moon um, missions happened in the uh, 60s onwards, they, they didn't have the kind of legislation that's in place now to actually protect us from what might, what might be life coming from, let's say, Mars, for instance, or any kind of sample that could come back in the foreseeable future or in our lifetimes anyway. Um, what was fascinating about her story was I loved the fact that she uh, had this lifelong friendship. Uh, so the piece is called Mentor. Margaret Race Planetary Protector. And these series of interviews that I did were all based on the idea of, of sci science fiction becoming science fact, or just using the trope of, of like the green screen as the, 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 you know, as evident in the video as this kind of show between fact and fiction all the time, because a lot of what is talked about isn't as yet proved, but it is based on so much research, um, like literally they only need to find life for everything to be, you know, uh, the case. So, um, and there's, a, there are evidentiary things on Mars that they can't explain as not being somehow uh, associated with something as yet. Anyway, um, yeah, I told you I'd be totally random. <laughs> Um, so. <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, she's she's looks she's a fascinating. It'd be amazing to see the full uh, for people to see the full film at some point because she's a really interesting character. Um, do you want? I'm I'm conscious that there's yeah. so many interesting people that we we <laughs> have to talk about and so many and there's so many things that are all kind of connected as well. So, do you want to go on to the next? Um, Let's go to the next presentation. Okay. Slide because okay. I perfect. That in the start, but of course I didn't. Um, um, yeah, because I think the other person who you interviewed, and I don't know if we have a clip yet, but is Lawrence Doyle, who, mm. who also is, is one of the most fascinating people. He was the first person to discover um, uh, Kepler-16b, which is a planet with two suns, and they, uh, you know, colloquially call it Tatooine from Star Wars. Um, but I also, you know, uh, my, one of my favorite anecdotes was when Lawrence first started to see work that came from the artists out of the residency. He, you know, again, tapped into that sort of philosophical sense and, and said, um, I understand what art can do for science now. It's spontaneous comprehension. Um, and I always think about that when um, seeing work like yours, where it, it is, it sort of takes poetics and humanity and scientific information and presents it back to us in a way that we can step into it in a way that we might not be able to step into a scientific paper. Well, I remember my, uh, my uh, MA thesis, one of the comments on it was, um, the world and everything else. And I thought, well, at the time that was a criticism, but actually <laughs> it's, it's what happened afterwards. Let's, let's have a look at the next slide. I'm sorry, I'm being all over the place. Um, okay, so astronomy. Um, we are the products of a billion year lineage of wandering stardust. We, all of us, are what happens when a primordial mixture of hydrogen and helium evolves for so long that it begins to ask where it came from. And that's a, a Jill Tarter quote. And so that was what, I don't know if anyone was uh, on in time to see the, the mobile piece at the beginning, the kinetic double mobile, but the, that piece is based on that quote. 
And it's the most amazing quote in that she, she has another quote where she says, the iron in my left hand came from this constellation, the iron or the, this, uh, this star, or I can't remember the exact wording, but then she says the iron in her right hand came from another star. Like there, it, it, every time I go there, I'm always just completely blown away. Um, and then there's a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson. One of the great challenges in this world is to know enough about a subject to think you're right, but not enough about the subject to know that you're wrong. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think it's an incredible quote in that what we do as a species is we have this massive tendency to rely on our conditioning rather than what we see. Uh, rely on belief systems rather than research. And so it is the, the important thing for us as a species to move forward and to evolve is to question everything. Um, so the history of evolution, sorry, the history of astronomy like evolution is simultaneously both the history of human promotion and demotion, but also a history of our uniqueness because of our ability to take the journey in realizing that fact. Um, and then I've just put a small bit, our solar system uh, orbits the center of the Milky Way galaxy at around 515,000 miles per hour. Um, we're in one of the galaxy's four spiral arms and our arm is called Orion. And we can start looking at the work now. <laughs> so next slide, please. So as, as we're looking at the work, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you, you know, like you were saying, there's so much overwhelming data and so much sort of awe and wonder that it can almost um, stop you in your tracks. And, and I know both of us um, have felt that many times when hearing from scientists and going to their labs. So how do you then synthesize that and decide what are the threads that you pull out? And, and of course, we're looking at this piece and you're pulling threads out of tapestries, so <laughs> pun intended. Um, but, but I do think that that's an interesting thing that you're doing because you're doing it both physically and um, conceptually. Yeah, I mean, the reason that I put so much um, uh, in, in terms of text at the beginning of this conversation was because when I arrived at um, NASA and SETI, I really didn't know that much about astronomy. I had read Cosmos uh, as a child by Carl Sagan, but like I had not looked at astronomy for a long, long time even though I had made works that had to do with the uh, moon missions and, and Rauschenberg's uh, involvement in EAT before. So basically with this exhibition, um, Tearing at the Fabric of Your Reality, and we can move on to the next slide as well. Um, I, was, um, I was thinking a lot about conditioning and reality and how the way we see reality and how we believe reality to be. And if the last four years show anything is, is the difference between, or depending on what you believe, reality and fantasy. Um, and so I was very interested in the fact that throughout human history that there has been a kind of tribalism, whether it be nationalistic or um, different types of territories competing all the time and the, the, the prevalence of war and the idea that we have been so destructive. And I think that the last century when we really lost the run of ourselves uh, with World War II, you begin to see the first kind of um, idea that we need to change radically. And, and it, it was the first time where you really did feel like the world was under threat from uh, the, the species in charge of it. And so um, I feel we have so much work to do on becoming less aggressive and more, um, more compassionate. And uh, so this... 
sorry, George, go on. Sorry, yeah. I was just gonna I was just gonna jump in there just for the sense of scale of this. What what kind of size is this piece? And can you talk a little bit about the actual because I think it's really important the the um the, the technique work. that you use, the 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 ta uh, oh, uh, sure. ta tapestry with embroidery because um and also let's just the words I think abandon nationalism, abandon tribalism and abandon terrorcentrism. Can you yes. chat a little bit about that? Because I know it kind of connects back to the film that we're going to see later a little bit as well. The sure, film. Sure. So perhaps you could put that into context first. So um, I think it, uh, oh God knows, uh, I, maybe three years ago, I started using jacquard. And what I, what I was interested in, um, so the film later discusses the the first mapping of the moon and the the mapping the first mapping of the moon was actually digital and so through telemetry all of the pho photographs were beamed back to earth and assembled on a kinescope television and so what they did uh, so i'll talk a little bit more about that later but the, the, I loved the idea of the first digital images coming from space. The other reason I really liked the jacquard was because binary code was used to make uh, jacquard and it was based on Boolean algebra. And so it has ones and zeros. And in 1994, IBM computers um, received program instructions from punched cards. And so this, this idea of this card system was then looked at, um, that was how jacquard looms then uh, produced images. And so the, the jacquard, even though it's analog, is the first digital image. And I was very interested in how the, the that technique um, and way of making textile was then looked at uh, by Alexander Turing to develop the Enigma machine, which of course resulted in the, the defeat um, of Germany in the Second World War, but also it has become the language that all subsequent, subsequent computers are based on, and all of those computers enabled space travel, like it is, it is the revolution that allowed for every single thing that you're seeing to happen. Yeah, that's incredible, I had no idea, yeah, and yet it's this beautiful tactile craft-based material as well, that's really yeah. kind of... That is a nightmare to work yeah. with. Um, so, <laughs> of course um, it is, of course. Why would you make it easier? <laughs> why is something easy? Never. Um, so, um, and then the text on this relates to the, the em embrace the human as the title, but abandon nationalism, abandon tribalism, and abandon terrorist centrism. Well, the first two relate to our problems with our recognition of each other. We're all the same family, we're all human, it's ridiculous. And so we need to evolve past those divisions and we need to find a peaceful way of, of having global cooperation. The funny thing, I mean, not funny, but the thing about the pandemic is the level of global cooperation that has resulted in. And if the only kind of, um, I mean, it's, I don't know that a global financial system is definitely an upside, but it is a fact of life now that um, that that is where we are. It is a global economy, and so we should have positive sides to globalization, you know, or encourage them. It also, oh, oh, sorry. Oh no, that's fine. Uh, Terracentrism is the concept which has come up multiple times at SETI. I'm sure Denise has heard it too. But Laurence Doyle, the the scientist, often said to me, "We need to be less provincial in, in our thinking." And so, when I was saying earlier about uh, de the demotion aspect of astronomy, the the um, the idea that so that geocentrism as it was called was when the when there were six planets or less and everyone believed um, that the the sun orbit and all of the other uh, planets orbited the earth and so um, that concept uh, remained for such a long time in astronomy and it was because of religion that it didn't change sooner um, and there are a number of points in history that you think it could have changed. Let's go on to the next slide. 
Sorry, I've just realized how many slides there are. Um, Denise, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. I was just going to say that those those phrases also too bring me back to that sort of timeline of the development of the universe as well and like how ridiculous it seems to hold on to these ideas given again that kind of the smallness of human history tiny um, and, and how quickly in that timeline of history we really um, I was just going to say, we really fucked things up, <laughs> you know, and, and how do we get to this point where the kind of, you know, another thing that Lawrence Doyle once said to me was that he worked at SETI because there he could dream. And like, and I wonder like how we can get to that point where the dreaming can be fruitful again um, and not so trapped in all of those isms. And it is a, it's an amazing thing because you can see it continually throughout recorded history that people do get trapped by isms. Um, and it's, uh, it is so for, for instance, you know, Isaac Newton, he determined through the prism experiments that there were six colors. And so because of um, his fascination with numerology and the number seven, he then invented a name, or he didn't invent it, but he, he invented a seventh color, which was indigo. Mm -hmm. And so because of the, this reliance on previous systems in any body of knowledge can affect anybody. And so it's like even, so um, even geocentrism with Plato. I mean, the, there, there, there are loads of different examples of this happening. And, you know, with, with the, um, good grief, my brain. Um, what was I going to say there? Uh, sorry, the, the, the Ptolemaic orbits or the five platonic solids. So there, there are all of these instances that somehow you're clinging to a previous system to justify something like geocentrism, or you're justifying it with Catholicism, or there are all sorts of ways that people think about things that may, um, may inhibit research. And, um, and the mobile that you showed at the beginning actually talks about all of those things like the platonic solids are on there yeah. and, and talks about the different ways in which we try to understand the universe. And they were, I mean, they, the um, Ptolemaic orbits um, theorized by Ptolemy, I mean, they were heavily influenced by the polyistic religion. Um, and so that isn't even um, a Christian thing. That is something that happened beforehand. So there are all of these different um, elements of astronomy that then get reformulated and, and remove certain things from the ideas later. Um, this is looking for further the search for life on other planets. Um, so in this piece, I didn't even try to replicate a solar system. It's just a kind of completely um, a, a kind of whimsical version of a, a possible solar system because the, the scale of what has been found on the Kepler missions, I think over 4,000 planets were found on the Kepler missions and how they find the planets is that they're looking at a star and they're waiting for shadows to come across the front of the star. And that's how they check the orbit and, and multiple orbits. And then they, they uh, that's a very simplistic version of describing the Kepler mission, but you get the idea. Um, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Roughly, how big are these embroideries, George? Pardon? How big are these embroideries? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't answer any question there. Uh, so <laughs> I think that is uh, six foot tall by mm -hmm. about um, five, by, by about 60 inches wide or 58 inches wide. They're impossible to make because you have to walk around for each stitch. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I managed to figure out a scale. I have to orbit the tapestry to <laughs> make the <plan>. <laughs> <laughs> Figured out a scale is virtually impossible to make. Um, next slide, please. 
So um, this one is called Voyaging Inter Intergalactic Diplomacy. And so the image that is on here, so the, the image behind it firstly is a double rainbow and um, Denise touched on it before. So Kepler 16b was found in 2011 by um, scientist Lawrence Doyle on the Kepler mission at that point at NASA. And it was a circumbinary planet, so it orbits two stars. And so because of that, you can have double rainbows on um, Kepler 16b. And the, the diagram in front of that, uh, which is also uh, in a rainbow-like um, selection of colors, is the uh, Voyager. And so Voyager 1 and 2 were space probes that were sent out in, I think it was 1977, but I could be wrong there. Anyway, they were launched and um, they were sent to uh, catalog Saturn and I'm blanking on the other planet that they were going to deal with. But the, the really amazing thing about that mission, you can go on to the next slide as a detail Thank you. There's also an, an interesting moment because I, I believe the that the, um, I believe that the contact with Voyager 2 had dropped out for a few months and they were just yeah. able to recontact it again like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And, and the, Voyager uh, 1, of course, has left the solar system. Solar system. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Could we go to the next? Um, it's a diagram. And so the what is so ambitious and so mind mind-blowing and it's it's to do with Carl Sagan as well is the golden record and so this was sent this was attached to the the Voyager uh, space probe and on it was a, a kind of representative selection of um, culture from all over the world and so the, it, it was the first attempt to somehow be, uh, to conduct uh, intergalactic diplomacy. And so it is a fascinating point in history and a real, um, it's, there's something so idealistic about this. And, and, and I think it's, it, it is one of those legends that has gone down in history from, from the 70s onwards. And I was really, really nervous about even showing it in a piece of work, work but I got over it, I guess. Um, and then, so on this, there's a, there's a record player. Um, so that on the left is a record. And then on the, on the right, there's a diagram of how to play the record. And then below that, uh, there is um, a star map of the constellation at the time of when this was sent out into space. And so it is, um, and then, yeah. So it is a fascinating object and it's a fascinating, um, idea, but also that is on the NASA website that you can actually read more about what it contains there. And the, uh, the actual audio record, uh, the audio mm -hmm. samplings have been released as a record um, yeah. as this kind of moment of trying to gather all the different uh, snippets of languages and um, different kinds of music um, and um, yeah, a real sort of snapshot of that moment. And it is, it is just wonderful. I mean, it is just an amazing um, artifact of the hope with the early um, space missions and the hope after that period of initially landing on the moon and the, 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 um, the idealism of that generation who, who like, you know, from the sixties onwards. George, I wonder if it makes sense um, not to sort of skip too far ahead, but while we're talking about these the kind of idealistic moments, and, and I know we're sort of getting close to time, but for you to talk a little bit about McMoon and the Moon Museum, because sure. that to me aligns so much with the golden record, but it's a story that almost nobody knows about. So um, the I, I 
basically, I went to the Rauschenberg residency, which was fascinating for all sorts of reasons. And one of them was that he was an environmentalist from the early 60s onwards, and one of the early members of all of the organizations that dealt with environmentalism. Um, what he did as well was he was he was very involved in EAT as an organization, Experiments in Art and Technology. And um, it's kind of a proto proto type to what the SETI residency was because it was about it took place at Bell Labs and it was about putting artists and engineers and scientists together um, to sort of dream about what they could do together. And what they did, one of the things that they did, which is the most famous thing I think they actually did, or one of them, was the Nine Evenings performances, which really kicked off performance art. Um, and so, oh God, where was I? I have no idea where I was there. Uh, Moon Museum and McMoon. Oh yes, okay. So, so I started... <laughs> Um, looking into Rauschenberg and the history of EAT. And then I suddenly realized there was this object, which is called the Moon Museum. And so it was him, David Navras, Forrest Myers, Andy Warhol, John Chamberlain. Oldenburg. And Klaus Oldenburg. And so the six of them went to Bell Labs and they used um, the motherboard technology they were using in phones, phones at the time to transcribe onto this tiny wafer um, ceramic wafer, uh, the six drawings. And so that, that object itself is the Moon Museum. So um, what happened next? Uh, Billy Kluver was helping them on that project. And so um, the, uh, so then the, that was the Moon Museum. There are three parts of this film. One is on the, the history of the moon and also our need to conserve cultural objects in the next century and the damage that's going to possibly do to the environment. So it's not a very straightforward road and that we need to take with this. The other part was the Moon Museum as an object, an art historical object, and also its um, covert um, inclusion on the Apollo 12 mission, which was confirmed in the film by Forrest, the artist Forrest Myers, um, who, whose part in the film was filmed by Julie Martin, who was the director of EAT. Um, and then the third narrative that's going through it is also a cons conservator's narrative of Dennis Wingo, who was in charge of the Lunar Orbit Orbiter Image Recovery Project, um, which was housed and happened in the, um, on the base of NASA Ames. And it was called, uh, it was nicknamed Mac Moons, but actually it was in an, an abandoned McDonald's, which as it turns out, has the perfect climate for conservation because of all of the chip fryers so that you don't smell of chips while you're in there. And what they did there was they took all of the film of the original, the original films of the moon and yeah. they were digitizing that whole archive, which was due to be sort of put in a dumpster. Exactly. Incredible. And so it is this incredible story of conservation or what we value and mm -hmm. what, what would be valuable in terms of how we look at art even. And there are two drawings on this presentation that relate to that as well. Should we just play the clip first? Yeah, let's go to the clip and then um, we'll chat a little bit more about that because there are a couple of questions coming in which we might um, get to. I just want to check with both of you. Um, we're, we're 10 minutes from two. Are you okay to go over a couple of minutes or do you need to finish at two? Sure, we yeah. can go. Through, okay, yeah. we'll see how we go. But yeah, let's, if, if, if Matt can line up that next clip. So this is McDonald's. Uh, where we're at right now, this is, an uh, as we call it, an abandoned McDonald's. Uh, it's actually part of the Navy. This is an old Navy base here. It's called Moffett Field. Uh, been a Navy base since the 1930s, and it had been shut down in the 1990s. Well, yeah, shut down is kind of a fuzzy word around here and so it kind of slow things just kind of slowed down slowly well by 2008 uh, I've actually eaten here when this was a McDonald's uh, yeah it's kind of funny uh, the McDonald's corporation was leaving they were shutting this down well normally uh, when something like that happens they tear down the building and sell the land um, 
but this is a, a federal facility, so they couldn't do that, so they just left. And so uh, that was in April of 2008, and we're here in July. We're about to get money, and so NASA provides this building to us as a um, uh, government-furnished equipment because um, one of the ladies here said, uh, well, they just shut down the McDonald's. Uh, you guys are going to be soldering. They've got all these fans over there to just suck the fumes up. We're going, oh, okay, that makes sense. We never had any inkling that there would be a public interest aspect to us working in an abandoned McDonald's. It was just kind of like, well, it was either the McDonald's or the beauty shop. There was an old beauty shop over here that's since been torn down. But somebody ran a car into it right before we were thinking about moving in. And we knew the air conditioners worked here. So we're going, yeah, let's go into the McDonald's. That'll give us plenty of space. And the rest, as they say, is history. The day before the moon shot, I get a telegram was, was slipped under my door and it said something like A-OK. -okay. It, was, it was like, it was like uh, uh, space talk, A-OK, -okay, uh, uh, all systems go, uh, you're on. And, and, and it jumped up and down, went over to Max's with the telegram and we started drinking champagne. So. Anything, the thing lands and uh, they get out and walk around the moon and, and they come back in, in the re-entry capsule and they leave, the, um, they leave the space capsule there and still there. So the Moon Museum is on the moon and it, it makes sort of this nice triangle between you, the moon, and it. Of the many possibilities implicit in the Apollo missions, one was perhaps not so evident at the time, namely, the saving of the entirety of human cultural production. When an article came out in the New York Times about the art objects smuggled aboard Apollo 12, attached to the intrepid landing module and left on the moon's surface, no one realized that the moon might pose the answer to saving our culture from the collateral ravages stemming from the destruction of our environment and tribal violence against each other. Because the moon has no atmosphere, it also has no weather, making it a perfect candidate for storing our cultural objects. The only extreme factor is temperature. All Apollo missions were scheduled to arrive at lunar dawn for this reason. Even 50 years on from our first moon visit, we were still unsure whether we would be able to save our environment, let alone anything else. The Earth was facing catastrophically disrupted weather patterns, increasing in scale and occurrence. Action needed to be taken to plan for the infinity of our species and collective cultural output. Debates began as to whether the Moon would be an effective candidate for cultural preservation. Due to the need for long-term conservation and the scale of storage required, the International Space Station was hopelessly inadequate in terms of scale. The Moon had its own issues. A lunar day is equivalent to 29.5 days on Earth. In 2028, an underground facility was begun. NASA, ESA, the Roscosmos State Corporation for Space Activities, and China National Space Administration led the customization of a solar-powered energy storage system to fuel the center, nicknamed the Ark. The storage cases developed by NASA were constructed from the same reinforced carbon-carbon used for shuttle missions. Each case, carrying the precious cargo, was outfitted with its own landing equipment and tracking device in order to ensure that the art objects could survive disaster on the way there. After the Earth was narrowly missed by an asteroid named Bennu in 2035, cultural institutions clamoured to get on the list. Each made cases for specific art objects in their collections, and representative pieces from global indigenous tribes describing our collective history were selected to be sent to the Ocean of Storms. One person's idea to take a piece of art from our nearest celestial neighbour prophetically mapped the trajectory for saving a representative fragment of human cultural output.
I think that's um, it. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, there's so much to kind of talk about in those clips and I'm trying to kind of um, gather my thoughts a little bit because they all give a good sense of um, of each area of research that you're looking at. But I suppose the first thing is, you know, when you when you it's it's incredible, like Denise was saying, um, first of all, that the, the Moon Museum that really I mean, the first time I met you, we were talking about it, but that I'd never heard of it. And what I love about the way it's introduced in the film is that it it runs alongside a, a fictional narrative as well. So you have to kind of check yourself to to, to make sure that that is something that actually happened. Um, and then the informality of the McMoon as well. I think you talked about that before. Just, you know, it feels very much like a, a, a way an artist might set up their working space as well. And the fact that it's in this um, so-called abandoned McDonald's, it just seems sort of insane that it's so, you know, that it's so kind of casual and informal and um, and that they have these an, an amazing um, images. Um, so I suppose I have a, a question for, for both of you, but um, I do you want to go back and just talk about the new museum a little bit because it just leads it leads into a couple of works that I think you are going to show as well. Sure, um, we can if you want to show the next slide. Um, might be a few after that, actually. It's the proposition we, proposition one and two. I think the drawings. Just um, keep just keep going. We can we can next next. Well, do you want to chat, Jordan? I'll, I'll yeah. stop Mac when he gets to them. <laughs> Fine, let's, let's just keep moving. This one, okay. um, the, the last ones. Oh, yes, oh, yeah. here we are. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Mac. Um, let's go to the next one. Okay. Perfect. So as, as uh, sometimes with the film pieces, I end up doing a, a related series of works. And these are two drawings that related to the idea of proposition for the for museums on the moon, essentially. And so this one is the Museum of the 20th Century, an interior with the rabbit by Jeff Koons, which of course is on the moon in a kind of Buckminster Fuller-esque dome museum. And the next one, the next slide, yep, yeah, is uh, the, the Glass House by Philip Johnson, which is a modernist masterpiece again in another modernist masterpiece, I guess. I'm not quite sure what term you can put Buckminster Fuller under. Um, so again, these were just other two possibilities of, of uh, museums there. Obviously you'd need a lot of storage, which would need to be underground for temperature reasons. Um, but again, these are, this is the more fantastical side of, of what I'm actually making. Um, Yes, I don't know that. Uh, do I have much more to say? About well, why do you think the like, I mean, the the Moon Museum, like, you know, why isn't that more widely known? I suppose, and that's what Denise Denise touched on that earlier. Is there? I mean, obviously, like, it was very covert, like you say at the time, and it was unbelievable that it was pulled off. Like, and you can't even imagine something <laughs> like that happening today. It would be, but, a, you know, a global crisis. But. Um, do you know is there any reason why you think it wasn't more I think because it was never ever admitted to by NASA because mm. of course you know it, it contravenes I'm sure any kind of security system they may have had in place but what happened was that a lot of the engineers so so basically he knew an engineer and the engineers were smuggling personal effects onto mm. Apollo 12 to be left on the moon and so um, it is a kind of the, the, the more I went into it, the more realistic it seemed and not the other way around. But because it's never been officially acknowledged by NASA, then, on, and then no one's been back. So someone needs to go back to the moon in order to prove this. Okay, so. George, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> so um, nominate you, Miranda. <laughs> happily, happily in this world. <laughs> Actually, I it kind of, um, I mean, there's so much we could talk about and I, um, I mean, I'm conscious of the time and I'm so um, glued to everything that both of you are, are talking about. Um, one thing that has come up, I think, um, you know, in your work, and I know in Denise, in your own curatorial work, is um, 
you know, of course, the artist is contributing to the production of stuff. Um, and, you know, there's environmental kind of concerns around the production of artworks as well. Um, maybe you could both kind of talk a little bit about that. Certainly, um, you know, in terms of more, yeah, more work being produced and how do we, how do we kind of um, deal with the responsibilities of that, not only in terms of like actual physical things, but also the travel that um, that is generated by art. And maybe Denise, you could start with that. How how do you kind of tackle that in your curatorial? It's you know, it's really complicated. I mean, I think the the drawing that we just showed of George with the coon's bunny and this idea that like, oh, maybe what can be saved are tiny tiny things because uh, we can't grab all the big things. Um, I, I often think of like, we need a shrinking ray um, <laughs> to be able to yeah. save everything. But, um, you know, it, it is it is a real problem. And I know a lot of curators have talked about not traveling as much. Of course, in the time of COVID, we see how our lack of travel and all of that is, is positively affecting the planet. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like, it's hard for deniers to, you know, they'll, they'll keep denying, but it's harder and harder for them to do that if they believe in science. Um, but, and I think a lot of what we do here at MassMoke is we try to recycle material mm -hmm. as much as possible. So like, because we're commissioning a lot of large scale things, we do our best to save materials and reuse them and um, to, to how, however often we can do that um, so that we're not constantly just adding to the landfill. But, mm. you know, I think this is a, a huge problem just in general with art, but not, not just with art. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think you're right totally. And I think maybe the issue arises is when was when the art kind of directly addresses it in one way, but not in the other. And I think that's something that we're seeing a lot now is, is exactly. conceptually addressing it, but not actually addressing it within the work yeah. itself. It's Absolutely. A, it's a massive problem. And it's something that I'm constantly thinking about, but I think probably failing at, to be honest. Um, I do try to make work in traditional materials when I'm actually making, making work. But other than that, you know, it's mm -hmm. film and it needs storage. And that storage is online yeah. a lot of the time. And that means electricity. It's, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. I do, um, I don't recycle materials. I just give them to other artists. Mm -hmm. um, that's interesting too. You know, it, 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 it brings yeah. in other... And I feel like that's especially important for people doing international residencies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hand it on. You're not taking it home. If it's yeah. not finished, you're not taking it home. So just and, and one of the great reasons why like SETI is in a production based residence. Mm. Like, yes, people yeah. make things, but it's not about like, come here and make this thing. And then you have this thing. It could yeah. just as well be about spending two years having an exchange of ideas. Yeah, which is which is kind of how we brings us back to where we started. And I think just what, there's one question that's on the on the list here. But um, after I ask this, we might would we jump to the um, Captiva clip and then wrap it up with one or two more questions if that's. Do you want sure. to that, Georgia? So just it kind of comes back to where we started, but um, somebody's asked about how the artists in residence um, program informed the scientists' understanding of what contemporary art is and does, and I guess it, it kind of speaks to how we began. But any thoughts on on that? On and, I'll, that and I'll just make a quick note that the person asking the question is Bettina Forge, who is the director of the SETI Air program. She ah, had to call there off you go. Her. Okay. <laughs> Here until just a couple minutes ago. Very good. Yeah, brilliant. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> how how yeah. has your presence? How do you think your presence as an artist has informed the SETI scientists' understanding of what contemporary art does? I mean, I hope I hope it positively informs how they think contem uh, contemporary artists are. I try to be as respectful as possible of their time and try to be as respectful as possible of re-quoting their research, which of course is highly problematic at times, I'm sure you can imagine. The, um, 
I, I honestly, I was really, really worried about doing that residency. And the from day one, the the ability of the scientists really to translate complex concepts into something you can actually translate into art was the most inspiring thing for me. I mean, Lawrence Doyle um, took me into a room because I asked him about information theory as it applies to animals because they're going to apply that to artificial signals. Mm. And so through information theory, he's been looking at different species and how to actually interpret whether they have syntax and whether they have a formalized language. And so he took me into a room which could only be described as like the beautiful mind, you know, when he's brought into the <laughs> room. And I just was like, we just need to leave here now, Lawrence, because there's just no way that I can deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that's one of the amazing things that that you know having the artist there does does create like I remember the first time I started talking with the scientists there and and you know a few of them not not everybody a few of them said like well so we're bringing in artists to make drawings of what mm -hmm. we're doing mm -hmm. and it's like that immediate thing of like nope um what we want to do is bring in artists to have conversations and like the story you told about going into the lab and them explaining what they do and thinking it's different from what an artist does or Lawrence Doyle saying spontaneous comprehension. I think that has been the really remarkable thing that this program has done is um, it's, it's just created that kind of synergy between artists and scientists. And, you know, so many of not just scientists, but so many people in the world that don't end up pursuing art as their career. So much of their art, art education ends with like Monet or Picasso. Yeah. Yeah. And so what this did was it actually brought art to life, I think for a lot of the scientists and made them realize that what their, that their, stu their labs and an artist's studio aren't so far apart. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you could see that as we would talk to people, that kind of light bulb go off and, and realize that they were just having a conversation of like one curious person to the next. Yeah. And do you have a science background, Denise, as a matter of interest? I don't, not do at all. Not? Okay, so you've learned just, a lot from them because- you're a science nerd. And you're on the advisory committee. Are you still on the I'm advisory committee? Not anymore, but okay. it was for many years. I, yeah, okay, well, fascinating. Mass Mocha just sucked up the rest of it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, no, it's such an interesting, and I think I do, like I said earlier, do I really feel that these, these residency programs need need somebody kind of in, in, in the middle to, to navigate both sides and to really get the best of a kind of a, um, you know, a fruitful um, collaboration. And you can really see from, from George's work and the way he talks about it as well is that he's put a lot of time into it. And I think that's something that else, else that should be, um, you know, thought more deeply about is lo very long-term residencies where the artists can kind of come and go, but really engage in those conversations. Because and, and it's one of the, the great things that Bettina has actually taken over the program because she was in the cohort of residents with George as a kind of um, archivist and historian. So yeah. she's been documenting everything. And so when the opportunity came for her to sort of um, really work with the administration administ during this program, it was a perfect thing because she was already so deeply embedded in it too. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. Well, look, I think it's ten past two. Um, what if we we say our our thanks and goodbyes and we finish with the Captiva film? Do, do is there anything you want to say about it, George? Before we go to that, I think that's a I think it's a great idea. One thing I want to say is that we are. Part of who we are and in our bodies, we're in a tiny, tiny timeline. And the, the further we can look into the past and the future, the better for all of us. And to get a grip, to, to get a, an idea of the scope of what we're within. And it, it will instill a sense of wonder on anybody. Yeah. Um, the final clip um, is uh, from Unnatural History, Drowning Captiva. And it was one of the other projects that poor Denise worked on me with. And uh, <laughs> I turned it in in the end. And um, it, it's about the island of Captiva, which was where uh, Rauschenberg lived mostly 
between there and New York. And he moved down there in 1963. And his studio was there. And the studio, after he died, became the Rattenberg Residency. What he did was he conserved 28 acres and started buying properties on Captiva to try and conserve the land from it being turned into a five-star hotel uh, or several five-star hotels, which, which each of them just demolished the natural jungle that existed on the island and became golf courses um, and swim pools, etc. And so he did this amazing um, thing for that island. And so also it is. it has three narratives. One is the 60s and that's meant to be Rautenberg narrating about gay rights, women's rights and human rights in general. Um, and then it has a, a sci-fi narrative of future laws that will come into place to stop people uh, damaging the earth any further. So, and then it has a present day one and I'm blanking on what that's about. So let's, <laughs> let's play it. Okay, well, just before we do that, Mac, just to say um, thank you so much to George and Denise. I could listen to both of you all day. So um, that was wonderful. And just to the Irish Arts Centre, Silas New and Ulterior Gallery. Um, so thank you to everybody. It was really enjoyable. And I think that we'll, we'll just, we probably won't come back after the, the, um, the clip. So we'll play, we'll play us out with um, the film. Thank you. You are standing on planet Earth. It spins on its axis at 1,100 miles per hour, traveling around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. In turn, the sun orbits the Milky Way at 485,912 miles per hour. Terra firma, as we refer to it, is a time-based ephemeral object. Ephemerality is a time-based concept related to something ending during one's lifespan or comprehension. But as the Earth's demise is far beyond that of anyone living, it takes on a permanence we take for granted. We are, by comparison, much more ephemeral than the Earth. Some scientists predict that we have a hundred years left before we completely destroy the conditions we have evolved to live in. If you can understand this, you are part of the problem. Shamefully, we are the only animals conscious of this fact and alone in inflicting the damage. Unlike other animals, we have carbon footprints. We know what we are doing and do it anyway in the practice of a kind of cynical ideology. We are victims to ideologies we've created, cultural systems such as religion and politics. We project them onto nature to deny our animality. Religion is a patriarchal system where little questioning is encouraged. This disconnect or stepping outside of nature causes us to deny the damage we are doing. We deny the Earth's age because of our perception of what is ancient. Religious books from a few thousand years ago seem true because of our addiction to ritual and tradition as tools for the management of chaos. It is fundamentally important to our survival that we step outside of our conditioning, not simply abandoning received information, but questioning its validity and the possibility that we are wrong. The inherent narcissism of culture means that we are blinded by our traditions but there is an older, more advanced order than any belief system we've invented. We could simply trust the Earth, an 85 billion year old fact. I've been fascinated by space travel ever since reading about Laika the dog, who was launched into space in 57. 
I even named a lane on Captiva Island in honor of her. We live in a time of amazing technological advancements. We can travel all over and see the world in an unprecedented way. We are in the first century where an aerial view of the earth is possible. With the advent of photography and television, we have an amazing source of visual knowledge, a much fuller understanding of the world. Soon, we will all be able to travel to the moon and have colonies there, as well as other planets. I didn't know that during my life, we would go from science fiction to science fact. Uh, being invited to the launch of Apollo 11 was one of the major events of my life. It made me think anything can happen and that we are at an amazingly important accelerated time in history. <laughs> 